Okay, right. So we're going to look at the broadcast receiver model, which is how Android communicates with background processes. We're going to show you how to start and stop services, because obviously a service runs in the background, therefore you've got no interface to interact with it. So when we work with services, we have to create effectively two applications. We have to create a background service, and then we have to create a, a visible app, which allows you to monitor, start and stop it. We're going to look at geofencing, which is a kind of good application of uh, services. Geofencing is where you walk up to something, and as you approach a given GPS location, it triggers an event. And as you walk out of the fence, it triggers the event again. And we'll look at custom toast messages, which are kind of cool. I did this with one of the projects a year or two ago. Okay, so, basically, broadcast receiver model. This is one of those design patterns that we, uh, we talked about. It's like model view controller. Is We've kind of talked about this with iPhone development, but it also relates to Android. The broadcast receiver is remember the radio station we talked about when we talked about, um, guys? <clears throat> when we talked about iPhone development, where you can, you can broadcast messages, and then you can pick them up. You can tune your receiver to pick them up. And the good thing about Android is it has lot, it broadcasts lots of messages. You've seen the messages, you know when you look at the, um, the, the log cat and you get all that stuff coming through, all those extra stuff, that's a lot of its messages coming from the system being broadcast. So things like battery status changed, like your battery's getting low, broadcast message. Someone switched the Wi-Fi on, there's a Wi-Fi signal. Yeah, you get the broadcast message. <clears throat> things like phone orientation also triggers broadcast messages. Okay, And the idea is... <clears throat> You can write applications that listen out for these messages and do things. What we're going to do, we're going to look at GPS as the example, where we can set up the GPS system to trigger messages at certain points, and we can listen out for those messages and do something with them. The advantage of that is the other way of doing it would be polling, wouldn't it, where you're constantly asking the sensor, where are you, where are you, yeah, constant checking. And of course, what that's going to do is drain the battery life. So we have this broadcast system where we just listen out for the messages as they're, de as they're delivered. <clears throat> okay, so services. There are two ways we can use services. We're going to focus on the first one today. The first one is you can do things without user input. They run in the background, you know, proper background processes. And the other one is the things like the calendar has a service which allows other people to use the calendar functionality. And we'll talk about that when we talk about implicit intents, which we'll think probably the next week, or possibly the week after. <coughs> now, all the services is an application with no user interface. Okay, so you can always start thinking of ideas, can't you, of how you can use services in your, uh, in your applications. <coughs> now, look carefully at the, how we declare a service. Look at the parent class. We don't extend activity, we extend service. So in other words, to create a service as part of your application, you create a new activity, but instead of a subclass here from activity, you subclass from service. So you can have a service that runs as part of your application in the background. And as you can see, there's the, there's the uh, life cycle. So you can see, we get, some, we get a, an event triggered on create, so we can build our service and create our, and build our classes. On start and on destroy. That makes sense. Notice how there's no on stop. Once it's running, it's running. Okay? So the only way to stop it is to destroy it, to completely shut the service down. So you haven't got this on pause, on resume, you haven't got this on stop. On create, on start, on destroy. And the on bind is when you bind your other applications to that service. That's implicit intents. That's how they work. And I'll try and show you some of those a bit later on. <clears throat> now, have you played with the manifest much? Yeah. yeah, a little bit. Just trying to tweak it a bit. Well, if you look at the service, can you see it's just like an activity, except we've got a service tag instead of an activity tag. Okay, but apart from that, it's the same, isn't it? You've got your name and a process, and the process is, your, um, is the thread in which it runs. So can you see that we need to add the activities to the manifest? And that's the activity, the service to the manifest. Now, this is why I did intents with you before. 
understanding how intense work is so important when we start dealing with services. So can you see that the process of launching a service is almost the same as starting a new activity? In fact, all I've done, I've just kind of nested two lines of code, haven't I, into a single line just to make it uh, shorter. So can you see that I create a new intent, I mention my service class, like I've mentioned my activity class, and I start the new intent. The difference is, once I'm, the activity is running, I haven't got an interface, have I? So I can't close and destroy that, in that service. So I have to have another method called stop service. And stop service takes exactly the same parameters, takes an intent, just like the start service. And it's always a good idea to have a little toast message, isn't it? Say, you know, background service started or code login or something like that so they know something's happened. Because otherwise, they hit the button and there's no visible change, is there? There's no, nothing pops up on the screen, no, no change at all. So starting and stopping services are really, really simple and straightforward. Also important, before you start services, which are already running, it's good to know if it's already running. So we have what's called an activity manager. An activity manager, manager has an array of processes that are running. And all you have to do is say, is there a service that matches the class name? That makes sense. So com.example notify service equals service.service.getClassName. The class of the service is the identifier of the service. So you can search to see if it's running. And on this example, I've just put a little log message saying service is running. So I can see if the service is currently running before I, start, before I stop it, for instance, or before I try and start it twice. Now, this is the fun bit. A service on its own can't do anything. It has no user interface. You can't even do toasts. Because you know the first parameter of a toast is this, isn't it? It's the current context. There is no current context. There's no interface, is there? There's nowhere to launch a toast from. So what we have to do, we have to create a receiver to listen out for the messages. <coughs> and as you can see, I create another class, and this extends broadcast receiver. So I've got extending service for my background service, I'm extending broadcast receiver for my, uh, for my broadcast receiver. And as you can see, there's one method, public void on receive, okay? And this allows me, you, put, you get the context and the intent. The context is this, isn't it? And the intent is whatever intent's triggered it. And we can listen out to messages. But before we do that, we've got to bind to the receiver. Now, Our server, our service, has to know, so to describe this, we have to effectively tune our receiver so we know what, what, where we, know, we know what it's supposed to be listening out to. And on the onCreate of our class, what we do is we create a, we use the register receiver. Now, Let's see, no, look carefully, let's show you this. Right. Okay, you see this com.example.service? Remember when you created your application, you had to put in that product name? Remember that, uh, that, that reverse URL you had to put in when you created your product name? And that's how it identifies the application that's running. So what we're doing, we create an intent filter to our application, and then we register receiver, and in this case, we're creating a new receiver and passing the intent. I'll show you how this works. In fact, let's go forward the slide and I'll show you how this, uh, we'll do an example of this. Okay, geofencing, really important concept. This works both for exterior using GPS receivers and also works in the interior using Bluetooth. You can have interior geofencing. I think Apple call it uh, iBeacon. So the idea of geofencing is, you create a perimeter around a latitude and longitude and you spe specify a radius, okay, an approximate radius. As 
the phone enters that radius, it triggers an event. As it leaves that radius, it triggers another event. So if you were a shop or a market store, you could have it as you walk up to the stall, you know, welcome to the stall, you know, these are the products for sale. When you leave it, you know, come again, offers next week are, and send, you know, send, send information for next time. So this is a very simple way of looking at it. So we specify a latitude, a longitude, and a radius. They're the three parameters we, when we define our geofence. And basically, the two events are it triggers notification on entry and notification on exit. Okay, so it's quite a useful feature and quite a useful, uh, useful, useful tool. And what you do basically is you set up lots and lots and lots of geofences. You have as many as you want, thousands of them. Because what it does, it uses the current location to load the appropriate fences into memory. And the rest of it doesn't get loaded, it just stays, it stays out of RAM. So you can have global geofences all over the place and as you walk around, it loads the nearby ones and triggers when you enter or exit. So for university, it'd be fantastic to have something where you walk up to buildings, it tells you about them, you walk away from buildings, and it triggers, and it triggers information. Okay, let's go back to geography. Okay, secondary school geography, about year eight, I think, wasn't it? You did this. Latitude and longitude. Let's not get the two mixed up here. The best way to remember it is longitude is long. Yeah? Longitude is a long, long axis. Latitude is a short axis. Okay? You've got to get this right, otherwise you'll end up somewhere off the coast of Africa when you start doing your, uh, your geofencing. The zero, zero is just off the, off the, uh, off the sort of uh, the bulgy bit of Africa, just down a bit. Mate, I know this because I've got so many times I've gone wrong using, the, using the latitude and longitude. So, now the good news is, if you live in Greenwich, in London, you are on zero longitude. So your longitude will be exactly, if you stand on the datum line, at Greenwich Observatory, your longitude should be exactly zero. If you start heading west, it goes down into negative numbers. If you head east, it goes up into positive numbers. So you can thank the Royal Navy for that. Okay. Yes? Now, the Americans have tried to change things. If you look at some American maps, they've put the US in the middle of the map and everything else mapped up. But of course, all the latitude and longitudes are completely wrong. Okay? So, thanks to the Royal Navy, we are zero. We are the meridian. Um, of the latitude zero is going to be on the equator. So, as you can see, if you get your latitude long wrong, all your points end up about there. Just there, just off the coast of Africa. I feel like, you know, it should be stuck as a sort of a James Bond villain base there, shouldn't it? In a zero, zero. But that's where the zero, zero is. So in other words, if your Latin long results come back as zero, zero, there's a high possibility they're wrong. Ignore. Otherwise, you have a whole stack of pins, vertical stack of pins on, you know, on, a, on a piece of C. So latitude and longitude, very important you understand that. This is a cool little tool. What this is, is you can load this web page up, you click where you want to measure, and it gives you the latitude and longitude. So you can just copy and paste those and use them in your, in your code. So a nice, nice, easy way of doing it. It's quite an old picture there, isn't it? Quite an old, uh, old screenshot. What's, what's missing? Yeah. This is the student centre, look. And all this is now changed. We're sort of over here somewhere. Okay, so that's a, that's a screenshot taken from, the, uh, from, from before Google Maps managed to update the, uh, update the photography. Okay, <coughs> let's do a very simple example now of creating a geofence, the Android way. Okay, so on create. <coughs> now, I create an intent filter, I register my receiver, and the... Ah, right, there's a bit of mist out here, rather critical here. The lock manager is location manager. What I've forgotten to mention is that I've declared that. That has to be global. Yeah, I've forgotten to put that bit of code in. You see what I mean? Just like your buttons and things, you have to declare those before you use them. 
you have to declare those. So, so what I'm doing now is my location manager, which is a location manager object, I'm getting this location service. Get system service context location service. Now, when you run this, your application will crash. Why will it crash? What do you need to do? We're using location services. We need to activate the GPS. We need to tell the Android device we want to use the GPS. We have to modify our manifest file. We have to add a service to our manifest file. You know when you install an Android application, it says this application uses the following services, and they're listed, aren't they? access to files and folders, GPS and so on, you have to set that up in your Android manifest. Otherwise, it won't work. Rather, it's worse than not working, it will just crash. So make sure you go and change and add the correct service to your Android manifest. So here we are, look, I'm creating a new intent. I'm giving it a name. Okay. And then I add this pending intent. Now, pending intent an intent is something that happens right now, okay? It's immediate, you want to use it straight away. A pending intent sits there until the right moment occurs. It's like a hanging intent, yeah? So when you walk past this location, it's, there's an intent to do something. So this pending intent is all about, um, well, get broadcast, this, forget the one, that's just a flag, intent, pending intent, and then with my location manager, I add, now, this is the key bit, Add proximity alert, there's my latitude and my longitude, there's my radius in metres, so 30 metres, ignore the minus one, and there's my pending intent that's going to, be, going to be triggered. So it's a bit backwards, but you can see I've now added a, a proximity alert to my location manager, and that's why I have to declare the location manager as global, otherwise when that method closes I'll lose my location manager. So it's, so it's like your array lists and your uh, NS mutable arrays, it has to be global, otherwise you lose context. <coughs> and that's it. I've created a geofence. Okay, so I next need to show you how we trigger that geofence, don't I? How we, how we respond to entering and leaving the geofence. Here we are. Here's my intent receiver, and here's my on receive. And as you can see, I've got a Boolean called entering in my intent. And that Boolean is true or false. If it's true, we're entering. If it's false, we're leaving. But to make it easier, we've got a constant value called entering. We can, we're using here, look, can you see, Boolean entering. I get Boolean Extra, Location Manager. Now, the key here is that false at the end. And that basically means that if it can't decide if you're entering or leaving, default to leaving. That makes sense. If it's not there at all, you're leaving. If it's there and it's true, you're entering. And as you can see, if you're entering, entering. If you're not entering, you must be leaving, okay? and you can trigger different things to happen. So does that make sense? So the on receive allows you in one method to work out whether you're entering or leaving and to trigger the appropriate messages, the appropriate code. This is it. This is the bit you will forget the first time, I guarantee it, because I did. You run the application and your application crashes as soon as you try and run it. And that's because in the manifest, you have to use these special use, uses permissions tags. Now, there's three you might be interested in. Find location is the same as GPS. In fact, you use the GPS chip. Course location is using the cell towers for triangulation. So that gives you a rough location, but doesn't consume power. And mock location means in your simulator, or when you plug your phone into the computer, you can feed it lat and long values and pretend to be in different places and test the application from your desk. So I tend to stick all three of those in there when I'm developing. Then when I launch it, I'll get rid of this last one. So mock locations allows you to test it 
you can have kind of ODT files, I think they're called. Uh, not ODT, we'll talk about it. It's, um, oh, extensions, I've got that. I'll probably put this later on the slide, to be honest. Um, basically, there are special G, uh, XML files which contain root data tracks. You know, things on your, like your Nike Plus thing, when you're sort of running around, it tracks your location. It stores it as an XML file with a particular format. <coughs> right, custom toast. This is fun. We've done toasts, haven't we? Yeah. Popped up toast on the screen, we're happy with those. I'm going to show you how you can completely customise the toast message. You can put graphics in there, you can put borders in it, you can have different fonts, yeah? You've probably seen it in some of the applications. I did an application two years ago for, um, for lorry drivers, and what it did is, as you approached the service station, it popped up a toast in the shape of the, the uh, motorway services sign with all the different, all the different features, facilities on there, little graphics. And that's how I learned how to do custom toast. Okay, so custom toast. Now, the trick is, your custom toast is actually a view. It's an XML view. So you can build whatever controls you want into it. Whatever, labels, buttons, um, you can put in uh, images. <coughs> and what you do is, you, let's imagine my layout's called toast.xml. I create a layout inflator. I inflate my layout, pump it up, that's my layout, okay? And then once I've done that, remember all my controls have IDs, I can simply hook my code into those IDs and assign images and text and whatever I want to assign. Okay, so that's really, really nice and easy. So I've got my layout. The trick here, now the toast message, what I've done is I've broken it into separate lines. You know how you can chain methods together, can't you? Like toast, bar, bar, dot, show at the end. This could be one massive long line. But as you can see, the critical one is this. How long it took me to figure this out? T.setView. My toast set view allows me to specify the custom layout, my custom view. So does that make sense? So basically, I can create a beautiful custom toast, whatever I want in there, and treat it like a mini view. I can inflate it, I can connect things to it, I can change, I can change values of it. I mean, if it didn't disappear so quickly, I could even have buttons on it if I wanted to. But that'd be daft, wouldn't it, because it disappears after about five seconds. And that's how we create a custom toast. So it's actually really simple once, you, once you've seen it. So there we are, look. There's a little example of a custom toast. Okay, graphics in there. You can even change the background of it, because the, the overall view itself has, oh, has properties. Okay, another one, vibrating the phone. If you're working with services, this can be quite useful. Okay. Vibrator V equals vibrator context, get system service, context vibrator service. That makes sense. And we had location service before, didn't we? Well, the vibrator, but you've also got to do, of course, is classic one, that always forget, every time. You've got to put your permissions in to do that. So you can, you can access the phone vibration in a very simple way. So we actually done quite a bit, haven't we, in this quite a short session. We've looked at broadcast receiver, we've looked at services, how we start and stop them. We've had taken a brief look at geofencing, how you can build these nice geofences and have some nice location uh, services going on, and how to create a custom toast message. And this whole, this whole section, this whole presentation came from that project I did a couple of years ago. I'd use all these in one application. So I just basically raided my application bin. And found, that, and found all the cool bits of code that got it all to work. So it's a nice session, I think, today. I'm not doing the web service stuff because I want to make sure everyone's focusing before I do that one. That's really, really, really important. That will be next week when everyone's recovered from this, this, this assignment. Or in fact, if you haven't recovered by next week, I'll make it the week after. I want to give you plenty of time to recover from this. But I don't leave it so late that you forget. No, you haven't got time to finish the assignment. So I think next week's good. Okay, any questions about this? Yet more things to learn. Five weeks away from the end of term now. Five and a half weeks. Or put it another way, five and a half weeks away from getting all your assignment work, due, assignment work in. 305 deadline is in two weeks' time. 387 is going to be, there's one today, right at the end of term. It's the first Monday after the end of term. I've given you the weekend to finish. 
four, five. Yeah, this is seventh of April. Yeah, you're right. Because the fourth is a Friday. So it's during the seventh of April. No, it can't be the fifth. That's Saturday. It's got to be the seventh of April. What year are you in? <laughs> what planet all year? So it's the seventh of April. Yeah. So seventh of April. That's finished. But the three o five finishes early. The you know the three two one's all but done, isn't it? Got to get this Friday. So you should be winding down now in terms of some of the modules. Your, th long, your last module to finish is 303, isn't it? That's going to be next term. Okay, thanks, guys.